Thank you, everybody, for sharing your morning with me. I appreciate that. My name is Susan French. I'm head of product and client operations for BBVA Open Platform. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about banking as a service. Uh, the one thing Yuri left out of his presentation on convergence was how she pays for the services that she got, which is where I come in. I read an article, well, first let me say, this is probably your obligatory business API session. So I appreciate those of you who are business oriented staying around to listen and I will, I think there's a tad of technical content coming up, but most of this is about the business of banking as a service, why it's important and why it's changing the landscape of banking. A few weeks ago, I read an article by KPMG where they were talking about the level of fintech investment in 2018, and their estimate was that it's just south of $112 billion in 2018, and just north of $50 billion of that was here in the U.S., and many of the folks in this room probably work for some of the companies that were the recipients of that investment. Bank partnerships are key to those fintechs in almost every case, and API platforms are crucial to delivering that. Historically, those API platforms have been custom built or private or otherwise not a platform-based API service for banking. But now, that's where the industry is going. At a conference in New York a couple weeks ago, CB Insights posed the question, is banking having its AWS moment? I would argue that we are, and that banking as a service is providing the way for fintechs who need to build banking or payment services into their application to be able to do that nearly as quickly and easily as AWS enabled us all to launch infrastructure. So what do we mean by banking as a service? For us at BBVA, what banking as a service means are open APIs that allow companies like yours to white label banking services and payment services and integrate them fully into their applications in a way that enables you to deliver banking and payment services to your customers but still retain complete control over the user experience and over the design of your product. So whether you need to verify the identity of a customer who's signing up for your product or service, or whether you need to open a bank account for them or otherwise give them a way to manage a pool of funds, whether you need to give them the ability to have a debit card to access those funds with and to pay for those prescriptions and those doctor visits, or whether you need a way for them to move money from one place to another from one of their accounts to another account to pay a bill, to move money, to cross-border transfer. There are now banking as a service APIs that enable you to do that under the covers in a white labeled fashion inside your product and service. So you can manage what your user or your customer experiences, you can manage the flow, you can manage the branding, you can manage everything that you need to to create unique and clever user experiences without necessarily being tied to the way the bank would typically do those functions. So companies have you know, complete control of their branded and customer experience and their embedding banking capabilities via APIs under the covers. Allows those companies to operate within the bank's regulatory framework, which is critical if you are going to enable your customers to have access to the US banking system. Well-designed APIs with comprehensive documentation is a way to gain access to that information or those APIs and those services. And it provides a single point of access to a bank's wider set of services, in the case of BBVA, our global footprint, footprint and the global services that we offer as a company. How does that change things if you're a bank? If you're a bank like we are, or like our other banking companies are, to meet customer demand, you need to rethink the way you deliver your banking services. And there are typically two ways you can think about that from a strategic point of view. You can think about it as a distribution channel. Here's another way to deliver your branded bank services to your customers. Instead of sending your ACH files in through batch, you can now do it real time through an API. 
Alternatively, you can think about banking as a service and your API platform as a product platform that enables all sorts of businesses to do all sorts of things on top of your API, where you are delivering white-labeled products to a fintech or another business who is in turn delivering that product or service to consumers, small businesses, corporations, sole proprietors, whatever their customer constituent might be. The reason why that is a good thing for a bank is that it brings us customers that we wouldn't otherwise get because they're not in our geographic footprint or they're not the customers who would open a retail banking relationship with us. But because they are part of a fintech's product, they are, in fact, a customer of the bank. The network effect allows us to create relationships with people and businesses that wouldn't otherwise exist and allows us to enable fintechs to rapidly build a business that would be much more difficult for them to do if they didn't have APIs to gain access to the banking system. So what are the kinds of businesses that want to do this kind of thing? When we think about who the likely consumers of banking as a service APIs, they kind of fall into what we think of as five categories. The most obvious one is digital banks of which there are many. A couple of them, like Chime, just recently joined the Unicorn Club. But if you're a digital bank and you want to offer digital banking services to whatever your demographic constituency is, you need a bank sitting behind you who can open accounts, issue cards, and move money for you. On-demand services are one of the fastest growing segments of the fintech population, whether you're driving or picking up scooters or picking up bicycles or walking the dog or mowing the lawn or doing property management for people. There's a whole raft of fintechs that are growing up around the on-demand economy and the fact that they need to have embedded banking services within their application so they can pay people for that. So they can pay people so that they can uh, finance the expansion of their side business if that's what they're doing. Online marketplaces. There are a growing number of both closed and open marketplaces where entrepreneurs and fintechs are bringing together related parties of buyers and sellers to be able to exchange value with each other. One of our clients is building a closed marketplace for, of all things, private jet aircraft service, where they're bringing together a portal that will enable brokers and flight operators to communicate with each other book trips, deliver trips, pay and be paid with each other through a closed ecosystem that's designed specifically for that function and with banking APIs sitting underneath it to manage the flow of money. More and more enterprises, even large enterprises, think insurance companies, healthcare companies, more large merchants are increasingly moving from slower electronic payments to faster electronic payments or from checks to electronic payments. There's still an enormous amount of commerce done today on paper, with paper checks that can be done electronically. If you're an enterprise and you want to distribute B2B or B2C payments in bulk, you need a banking service underneath your covers in order to do that. Finally, there's a growing list of what I call financial management applications. These are fintechs who are building applications for both people and businesses to better manage their money and to improve their financial wealth, wellness and wealth. Whether it's helping millennials pay down their credit card debt or their student loans, or whether it's helping businesses, uh, sole proprietors manage their business more effectively, invoice their customers, manage their, their money, save for their vacations since they don't get paid vacations anymore if you're a sole proprietor. There's a whole raft of those, and there are many others but if you think about where the best opportunity is for banking as a service APIs to add value, these are the kinds of businesses that we think of. So I promised there would be a teeny bit of technical stuff, and it's pretty teeny, so you guys will get your business API merit badge for this session and lots and lots of technical content in the other sessions to come. At BBVA, we have two sets of APIs. We have the, a set of external facing APIs that our clients consume, and they're optimized for developer experience. Simple, straightforward, well-documented, easy to use APIs that are designed for clients to consume. 
On the other side, there are internal APIs that communicate with our core banking system. There are a huge library of microservices that do all sorts of small pieces of the overall movement of money or the creation of accounts. And there, are, there is an integration layer that talks to all sorts of third-party providers whose services are embedded within the services that we, in turn, offer to our clients, whether it's connecting to the Visa and MasterCard networks, working with account verification services, any number of third-party services are bundled within the overall service we offer to our clients so that they don't have to do that. They can consume it from us in a single API. And one sort of final plug for APIs, and I, I suspect this will come up in other sessions as well. I, ha I spoke recently at a customer experience conference, and one of the things I wanted to make sure everybody understood is that developer as customer is just as important as consumer as customer, and that it's important that the APIs that you do expose are well-designed, designed with the developer in mind, self-documenting if possible, easy to understand, simple to use. So if this is so great, why is it so hard? And why is it still an emerging set of API practice? Part of it is because banks live on legacy infrastructure, which is often old and rigid and batch-oriented and not very fertile ground for the creation of APIs. And just as banks' infrastructure is legacy rigid, so are their back office processes that go with it. And there is a change of both technology and process that have to go along in order for banking as a service APIs to be successfully delivered and easily consumed by clients. Digital authentication and authorization is still a challenge. We have an obligation as a bank to uh, verify the identity of everyone, consumer or business, who we give access to the financial services, financial uh, ecosystem of the US, and that's not always easy to do in a fully digital experience, particularly when you're doing identity verification of businesses rather than people, and particularly when you're doing it for non-US citizens. Regulation and compliance is a reality. If you're going to build banking services into your application, if you're going to move money through your application, there are compliance and regulatory requirements that you have to comply with and your provider, like us, has to comply with. And sometimes that makes it a challenge to create APIs that are easy to use and to create an onboarding process that is rapid and simple. Fraud and risk management is a challenge. When you move from legacy, sort of batch-oriented processes where there's plenty of time to look at the data that's coming in and plenty of time to look for fraud, when you're in a real-time environment where money is moving instantly, it's much more difficult to do, and the exposure grows commensurately. Cybersecurity and privacy. People, especially when they're entrusting you with their money, want to make sure that your environment is secure, that you're managing the privacy of their data, and that anybody you're sharing it with, such as third-party service providers, are managing their obligations for privacy and security as cleanly and as thoroughly as the bank is. And culture. Banks don't speak fintech and fintechs don't speak bank and there's a real cultural difference. If you're as a bank going to be delivering banking as a service and promoting fintech innovation, you really have to think about the culture of your business and develop empathy and understanding for the interests and needs of fintechs, especially startup fintechs if you're working with them, uh, and educate fintechs and others on the importance and of the regulatory and compliance obligations that the bank has. But cultural is critical. You can make great technology, but if the culture of the business doesn't encourage outreach, doesn't encourage partnerships and collaboration with fintechs, the technology doesn't do you any good. So where are we now in terms of the things that you can get uh, at, in a banking as a service API, not just from BBVA, but from many other providers? Typically today, you can find APIs from banks that will do automated know your customer 
an identity verification screening for consumers, depository services of various kinds. You can open checking accounts, savings accounts. You can use for, for benefit of accounts for aggregation. Most debit and credit cards issuance it can be done now by banking as a service APIs and certain payment rails. So ACH for sure, bill payments, domestic international wires, and not so much relevant here yet, but if you're a multinational or you're doing business in Europe, PSD2 compliant account and transaction access APIs are becoming more and more critical, especially with the PSD2 September uh, demand date coming up. Fairly soon, we will start to see API-based integration of more faster payment options, whether that's card-based, card network-based payments for things like push payments and disbursements, whether it's uh, better integration with the real-time payment system that the Clearinghouse is offering now, uh, simple digital loans that don't require a lot of paperwork and that can be handled electronically, employee services, different ways to pay people, whether it's traditional payroll services or push payments uh, to uh, debit cards of, of contractors and occasional employees. And seamless integration, more seamless integration of third-party services, whether it's account verification, fraud management, billing services into your overall structure. Things that are farther away are things that are more heavily paper-driven or for which there isn't abundant electronic data available to manage through an API, such as KYC on businesses. In the US, it's difficult to establish the uh, identity and legitimacy of a business without looking at paper in some form or another. Receivables and payables integration with most, most of the ERP systems that large companies use. More and more data. Everybody wants more data, and they want to integrate more data into their process, which means you need APIs that can go and grab it from whoever's got it and incorporate it into your process. Complex loans, trade finance, financial advisory services, all things that will come, they will get API-ified as part of a banking as a service platform, but not in the, not in the near term, at least in my opinion. So one at closing with a shameless plug for BBVA Open Platform. If you want to see what banking as a service APIs look like, please come visit us. Our APIs are open, and you can sign up for a developer account if you want to play with them. So at this point, we have six minutes or so left. Are there any questions? Yeah. Just a quick question about the on finance and loans, mm -hmm. um, what seem to be the biggest barriers to them making progress, given that there's already a fairly substantial amount of loan via API being done in the kind of consumer-oriented or small business? Uh, I think the, I think the, the you hit the nail on the head, which is consumer and small business. If there are unsecured, he was asking about why I think lending may be a little bit farther away. Think things that need paperwork or things that need in bank, that legacy bank infrastructure to transit through multiple systems. There's a underwriting system, there's a booking system, there's a paperwork system. Those things need to be knit together in the back office to create a fully digital experience with consumer loans and with small business loans that are basically consumer loans. That is happening more quickly. <clears throat> with corporate uh, and commercial lending, it'll be a while before all of those pieces resolve themselves, especially if they're secured loans and there's collateral paperwork involved. Any other questions? So I work for a big bank. Where do you see the challenges in fintech companies interacting with banking services? Is it with PII? Is it with understanding how they're able to use the data? Where is the, the stopgap there in challenge? I, I think there, there, 
and to, from the fintechs point of view, I think the primary issue is most of the fintechs that we work with, particularly ones that are in early stages of their development, really don't understand the, compl com the uh, regulatory environment that we live in and all what that means in terms of what's required of them. The technical onboarding is actually pretty straightforward. And if the APIs are well designed, the technical integration is fairly straightforward. But understanding why you have to have AML policy in UDAP and your NACHA audit and your, uh, your InfoSec policy and all of that, the very first version of onboarding we did with one of our clients had 35 different documents in it that the client was supposed to provide as part of onboarding. And most of our fintechs are focused on building their product, getting it out to market, finding their customers, raising money. And these things were like alien language. So I think looking for ways to both comply with our requirements as financial institutions, but also to find ways to make that easier and cleaner and more easily understandable is probably the biggest single challenge in large-scale adoption of banking as a service. I think most banks have a good handle on managing the PAI and the PII and have processes in place for fintechs who need to do a good job of managing that as well, but compliance and regulation is a challenge. Do you agree? <laughs> okay. One more question there. Yeah. So is there any sort of special support uh, in the APIs for merchant accounts? The one thing we don't do yet uh, and our platform is, is merchant acquiring, although it's one of the things that we're working on. Part of the reason for that is that there are already many, many uh, providers of API-based merchant acquiring, particularly for e-com. I expect we will get there eventually. So what we've been focusing on now is kind of the, the other aspects of banking as a service that aren't typically available through APIs, and that's the account creation, the depository relationships, and the card issuance. Two more minutes. Anybody else? We've got one more. Okay. No, no, not yet. So thank you. Okay. A big thank, thank you, you very much. to you, Susan.